Alan and Andy Anderson came to us last year. They moved from the state of Wisconsin. They're a delightful couple. If you've not met them, I'd encourage you to do that. Um, Annie was telling Ryan and I one day about uh, the way that they interact with people to try to connect with them, to witness to them, to share Christ with them. And it was so good that I said, would you be willing to video this? And with a little bit of persuasion and a little bit of coercion and, and uh, maybe a little bit of other things, we, they agreed to, to uh, be interviewed by Ryan. The, their interview is spectacular, the things that they say. So we have taken this. We're going to divide it into three. We want you to see the first part of it this week, the next two parts, the next two weeks. They go perfectly with the subject that we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks, which is the joy of God in the matter of salvation. So we want you to see this first clip. Go ahead. You know, and I've discovered over the over the years, both Annie and I have, that um, people really need to be heard uh, because of uh, the internet and social media. People seem to be isolated, and they really want to be heard. And uh, it, it, it's very surprising, after a short period of time, asking some personal questions: How are you feeling? What's going on in your life? they will really start to share. I had an incident where I have just completed my radiation therapy for prostate cancer, but one of the nurses, uh, and I had been going there for eight weeks, one of the nurses came, as I was getting completed, she started talking to me and sharing her whole life. The fact that she didn't graduate from high school, she had a child out of wedlock, uh, and that uh, she lost a lot of weight, and she was very self-conscious, didn't think she was smart. She got her GED, then she went on and received a scholarship to become a radiation therapist, and she shared all of that with me. And I, I was just led that uh, the next time I would meet with her, met with her, I wanted to find out if she was a Christian. I handed her a little book about uh, about Christ, but I wanted to find out what she, you know, where she was coming from. And I asked her, why did you open up and share all this life with me? She said, I think just because you, you seem to be friendly and open and interested in me. And I remember talking down the hallway with this nurse and another nurse in, a, in an office, she yelled out, hallelujah. And I turned around and looked into the office, and I said, I only hear that in church. He said, Amen. <laughs> so it's really interesting when people you give them the opportunity to share and listen to them, and boy, they will open up and share their life with you. And I thought that was a privilege that she did that. Well, and a nice thing happened at the grocery store the other day. Um, I, I tried to look at the, uh, uh, at the name tags of... Of people. People love to be called by their name. I like to be called by my name. Uh, and so I, I uh, greeted her by her name and she, she greeted me back with my name. That was the first time she acknowledged my name. And uh, so I frequently say, how, they'll say, how are you today? And, and most people just say fine and get on with their grocery shopping. But sometimes I'll say, um, well, how are you? To the, the cashier or whomever it might be. They frequently say fine, but then I can say, are you really fine? Or you look like you've got something on your mind. You don't really look great that today. There's something's going on. Very frequently there is something going on. Uh, in one particular case, uh, a woman had a very, very sore toe and it was really painful and that showed up on her face. On another occasion, it was difficulty with children, uh, with a husband, with a job. Uh, and as Al said, people, if given the opportunity, are frequently more than willing to share their life uh, in little in bits and pieces. You, if there's a waiting line at the grocery, you don't want to take too long. But uh, just just get, getting involved in somebody's life, uh, that's the starting point. Well, um, 
Well, we, I've discovered, and so has Annie, that uh, by just asking them personal questions, you know, how's your family? How's, how's your children? Uh, are you going to school? What are you studying? And start to draw them out and have them start to share a little bit of what's going on in their lives. And it's surprising how quickly they will share a lot about what's going on, whether it's good or bad. If a person uh, can share a little bit about their own life, uh, I have a, I have eye issues. I have a, I need to to have medication injected into my eye uh, eyeball every every six weeks or so, or I go blind. Uh, if someone else realizes that, you know, I I've, I've been through that's sort of a minor issue with by comparison. But if you if you personally have been through a little deep water, don't be afraid of sharing that. And it's it's a leveler. Invite them home. You know, you don't have to put a fancy meal out. Maybe pick up some cupcakes at Brothers or something and have coffee and cupcakes. You know, just something where they can see where you live and feel um, more, uh, I guess, at home. Not only in a home, but uh, at home with the people who live there. And it actually gets better. It's good stuff. With that, be finding Luke chapter 15, if you would. A great chapter, Luke chapter 15. What Al and Annie are describing on that video is our New Testament mandate. We call it Be the Church. And it has two aspects. Be the Church means to commit to membership and participate in Bible classes and gathered worship and in our prayer meetings, which, by the way, we have one at 5.30 tonight. That's, that's ground floor Christianity. Be the church also means that we represent Christ wherever he has sovereignly placed us, our homes, our workplaces, and other places that we go. A natural outworking of be the church is what we call one life. It's the call to preach the gospel wherever he has sovereignly placed us. So each member, regardless of age, focuses on at least one person to share the gospel with every year. And you heard some excellent ways in that video and some excellent ways in the training session that we had here yesterday. The reason this drives our church is this is the essence of the New Testament. I recently read where a significant number of confessing evangelicals said they did not know what the Great Commission is. So here we go. The Great Commission is Matthew chapter 28 where Jesus says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Let's just break that down. Go and make disciples. That's one life. A disciple is a saved person who is following Christ. And then teaching them to observe all that I commanded, that's be the church. So this is basic New Testament Christianity. And as Ryan said, this is a reason we try not to add new programs or clutter your calendar. We are very jealous of your time. Um, there's only so many things a church can do well, so you need time to pursue your one life, to be with your family, and to be in the Word. We're all told to redeem the time. The day comes when we run out of time. How we spend our time will affect all of eternity. So the Bible sets our agenda. We're to be like the Savior who came to seek and to save that which was lost, Look at these verses. They describe the salvation of the lost, but the main focus of the entire chapter is the joy of God over the salvation of lost sinners. And in this chapter, we have three parables, technically four, that illustrate this truth. We can only get to the first two this morning, but let's get a preview of the last two to better understand the theme of the entire chapter. Verse 11 starts uh, what we call the, the parable of the prodigal son. And I want to give you three common misunderstandings about this parable that will help us understand the whole chapter. Here's misunderstanding number one. The so-called prodigal was saved, then he backslid, then he repented, and he got back right with God. As you will see, he was lost. He wandered away into loose living. But he repents, comes to faith in Christ, and the Father greatly rejoices. Misunderstanding number two. The older son is actually a pouty believer. 
And he baffles us because we tend to identify with his complaint. He has always obeyed the father, so why doesn't the father bless him with a party? But the older son is also lost. He's upset that his brother is redeemed. He's mad at his father for celebrating his return. His brother should get what's coming to him, shame and punishment. And his only relationship to the father is that of a worker. He views the father as a slave driver. The Pharisees are just like this elder brother. They eventually conspire to kill the father. Misunderstanding number three. The central character in the parable isn't the prodigal son. It's the father. When the father speaks, the slaves respond. The father is the one who seeks the elder brother. The father seeks the younger brother. He extends grace to both brothers. He's overjoyed when his youngest son comes to him. And he woos the older son to come to him. This story is about him and the joy he experiences when a lost sinner is found. Joy is one of God's attributes. Now we know of his love and mercy and grace his anger, wrath, and justice. We know he's omnipotent and omnipresent, that he's omniscient, and all of his attributes exist in full at all time, but one of his attributes is joy. The Bible tells us that the triune God is full of joy. 1 Timothy 1.9 calls him blessed or happy. The Bible says God delighted over Israel. He delighted in David and those who faithfully serve him will enter into his joy. Here in verse 6, a shepherd rejoices when one lost sheep is found. In verse 7, we learn there is great joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. In verse 9, a woman rejoices at finding a lost coin. In verse 24, the father celebrates because a son who is dead is now alive. And verse 32 says he had to celebrate and rejoice. Now, lest we think that the Bible only portrays God as full of joy, we learn in Hebrews of Jesus' joy over the salvation of the lost. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. What was the joy set before him? His joy in redeeming the lost. The shame of the cross was worth bringing lost sinners home. And we see in Scripture that the third person of the Trinity and joy are inextricably linked. The disciples, it says, were continually filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2. Romans chapter 14. The kingdom is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 1 6 says that church received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So God is joyful when a lost sinner is found, and as the children of God, we will experience a similar joy when a man or woman comes to Christ. So here we go. The joy of God over the salvation of lost sinners, would you read with me Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. All the tax collectors and sinners were approaching to listen to him. And the Pharisees and scribes were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told this parable. What man among you who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it? When he has found it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together saying to them, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who do not need repentance. Or what woman has 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me because I have found the lost silver or the silver coin I lost. I tell you in the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. The joy of God over the salvation of lost sinners. The first thing I want you to see in this text is that there are two types of sinners. 
They're found in verse 1. Notice Jesus first refers to tax collectors. Now, they were singled out because they were the most hated of all. Rome demanded high taxes, so they commissioned domestic tax collectors and gave them free reign. Sometimes a group would collaborate, almost like an investment group, and they would pay a large sum to Rome, who it was subcontracted in essence, and in turn they gave them authority to collect taxes and whatever else they wanted to collect. They would set up toll booths on the traveled roads, and they might assess what you were carrying, and you had to pay what they deemed your tax right there on the spot. They extorted, threatened, and coerced people. So in the Jewish, Jewish sociological hierarchy, they were at the bottom. They were considered ceremonially, ceremonially unclean because of their contact with Gentiles. They were, viewed, they were viewed as traitors and sellouts to Rome, and so they were considered the worst sinners of all. You'll notice verse 1 then says the word sinners. The Jewish version of sinners included thieves and prostitutes, the lame, the blind, and the diseased, moneylenders, adulterers, drunkards, and Samaritans. That's quite a list. The Pharisees said, watch this. They considered almost anyone who is not exactly like them to be sinners. And Jesus was a friend of sinners, so they hated him for it. Now, as we seek our one life, we should be friends of sinners. I add two cautions to that. One is this, bad company does corrupt good morals, and we can begin to justify wrong living in the name of reaching someone. Kevin DeYoung said, Jesus ate with sinners can become Jesus loved a good party, which becomes Jesus was more interested in showing love, which becomes Jesus always sided with religious outsiders. The second caution is this. If you befriended someone years ago and you haven't shared the gospel, you're probably missing the point. God puts you in their path by His sovereignty. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So we have here in verse 1 this group of sinners. Jesus is their friend. And in verse 2 it says, the Pharisees and scribes were complaining, saying this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. The Pharisees believed that righteousness was keeping a wide distance from sinners. Their scribes would look up rabbinic law and then they would prescribe the number of feet or yards in our terms necessary to stay away from sinners in order to be righteous. You cross the street if you saw a sinner coming. You certainly never ate with one because to have a meal with someone in that day implied fellowship and unity with them. And they believed also that if you were a sinner, you needed to stay a sinner. You chose a lifestyle of sin, that's fine. You deserve what's coming to you. So the end of verse 1 would have validated their hatred for Jesus because it says, sinners were approaching to listen to him. There was a winsome attractiveness about Christ. Some were drawn to him. And we seek to be as winsome as possible when we share the gospel. As we went through this training session yesterday, something dawned on me. This is probably a Captain Obvious observation. But God uses every unique personality to reach to people. Some people are very bold and loud. Some people are very quiet and gentle and there's everything in between. God created you to be you. So let God use your unique personality as you seek your one life. And we have to do that because of lost sinners. You see, there are two types of lost sinners. We'll put them in groups. Group A would be the tax collectors and sinners. Group B would be the Pharisees. Many in group A knew they were sinners. Almost none in group B thought they were sinners. Today, the self-deception of group B continues. They believe that saving righteousness is found in themselves and the deeds that they do. And today, some trust in a cultural righteousness. And in their mind, Jesus is an icon charged with keeping Western culture intact, keeping them prosperous, and keeping sinners away. This is a person who curses the darkness and thanks God he is not like those sinners. Some sadly trust in a political righteousness. 
Jesus takes political sides, and I can tell you this, it's my side, it's not their side. And therefore, because I am not on that side, I am therefore righteous. Even more trust in a comparative righteous. I am righteous in comparison to them because I don't think like they do and I don't live like they do and I don't do those things they do. I commit no crimes and I'm kind to others. Surely God is pleased with me in comparison to them. So let's look at verse 1 and let's ask ourselves this. Where do we fit in that verse? Do you see yourself as a sinner? It's easy to say, I'm a sinner. I could just as well say, I'm a male. It's a statement of fact. But what if my sin doesn't bother me? What if I say, oh, I, I'm a sinner. But deep down inside, I have little concern about my sin. There's no contrition about my sin. I really don't need to change all that desperately. It's not that urgent. Friend, that's self-righteousness. A clear contrast is found in a repentant sinner. For example... For the self-righteous, preaching is an exercise in boredom. For the repentant sinner, they view it as a feast on the Word of God. The self-righteous yawns at Jesus' sacrifice. He died on a cross, he was buried, he rose again, he sits at the right hand of the Father, I've heard that before. The repentant sinner is ever grateful that Jesus died to forgive his sins and make him a new creation. You'll see that the prodigal son was broken by his sin, the elder brother was, why did you accept him? The self-righteous isn't really bothered by his sin. It's not a big deal. He's upset more about what others are doing and how they're ruining this country. That's the elder brother. For a repentant sinner, the awareness of sin is painful. He loathes its presence in his life. His focus isn't on other sinners. It's on the relentlessness of sin in his own heart. He long ago abandoned this delusion that he is able on his own merit to stand before God. He knows that he must be covered by the atoning blood of Christ. When he initially became aware of his sin, he may have thought, Jesus has to be repulsed by me. I am full of sin. How can he accept one like me? But then the good news of the gospel is preached. And he learns that Jesus welcomes sinners. And Jesus ate with sinners and was a friend of sinners. And then he thinks, well, perhaps he will take one like me. So he approaches Jesus and he listens to him. And he learns that righteousness is only found in Jesus' atoning death. And he repents of sins, believes in him, and he is saved. So one kind of sinner walks away from Jesus filled with damning self-righteousness. The other walks away covered with Jesus' perfect righteousness. And that takes us to the second point. Two types of sinner, one seeking Savior. The Pharisees and scribes are grumbling over all this. So as Jesus often did in his parables, he in essence says, that irritated you? Watch this. Verse 4. What man among you... Who has a hundred sheep and loses one of them does not leave the ninety-nine in the open field and go after the lost one until he finds it. This is offensive to them on a number of levels. Number one, he said, what man among you? He compares them to shepherds. There were tax collectors were about here and then shepherds were about here. They were unclean social outcasts. They weren't even allowed to testify in court. They were considered to be automatically dishonest. Comparing a Pharisee to a shepherd was a deep level insult, but not in Jesus' mind, because he will later call himself the good shepherd. Here he says a shepherd leaves 99 sheep to pursue just one. The Pharisees think that is idiotic. Losing one sheep is the cost of doing business. Not Jesus. Just one is worth the pursuit. The Bible compares us to sheep. <laughs> Anyone here raise sheep? That's not a compliment, is it, John? <laughs> I've read that sheep have the lowest brain weight to body size of all mammals. They're so dumb, they have no defense mechanism. If they're frightened, they lay down. They have no sense of direction, they just follow the herd. 
The only way to keep a sheep, a, a sheep safe is by a shepherd's constant care. Jesus wants every sheep safe, so he goes in search of the lost one. It was a shepherd's responsibility in that day to keep track of all the sheep. If he lost one, remember, he was considered to be dishonest. So he had to bring back evidence of its death. He had to bring back a body part or some fleece, something to prove it was killed. Otherwise, it was assumed he stole it. So shepherds became experts at tracking sheep. They could track one for long distances. And verse 4 says, he goes after the lost one. The biblical description of those who do not know Jesus Christ is not unsaved. It is lost. Now, we use the word lost regarding keys or a purse. But when a person is lost, it's terrifying. Now, this is a true story, and it's going to illustrate my incredible ignorance. I thought someone might say amen there. I set that one up really well for you. Several years ago, we couldn't find our middle son, Joseph. He worked at the local bank, and one night, he and his co-worker who closed the bank, we couldn't find him. So after an agonizing time, we finally called the police. Now, they were very professional and polite, but understandably skeptical. Are you sure he didn't run off with a girlfriend? Are you sure he didn't run out with some friends? And I said, I know this sounds like a delusional parent, but... Other kids, maybe, not him. Well, I mean, we call him Captain Reliable. He, 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 I'm telling you, he, he, something is going on. And we can't find his coworker. Both the city and the county police were in our kitchen, and they're asking us questions. And again, they're being polite. And then suddenly, there was a distinct change in their demeanor. My wife's down here about to cry as we remember this story. You could just feel the intensity in the room rise. I could hear him calling other officers, and I could hear other calls being made, and voices became urgent. Footsteps started to quicken in and out of the house. And I heard one officer say, Look, we can't find the president, the marketing manager, or the head teller. Now, adrenaline just shot through us. You think, surely not. I mean, this is stuff you read about that happens to other people. But stranger things have happened. I, I felt completely sick. About 15 minutes later, someone reached the husband of Joseph's co-worker. He was at a Christmas party with his wife and with Joseph and the rest of the bank employees. <laughs> they couldn't hear their phones over the noise in the restaurant. But here's what makes it a whole lot worse. The night before, he told Tara and I where he was going and what he was doing, and somehow we both completely forgot. So we told all the policemen, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I know you've never run into an idiot like us. They just were very polite and thanked us, and I wonder they probably still talk about it. But man, there was tremendous relief. Because what was once lost was now found. Now, I don't think, I don't think that we really believe, we couldn't. We couldn't believe in our heart of hearts that people without the biblical Jesus are eternally lost. We couldn't believe that or we wouldn't be as apathetic as we are about it. We'll have a prayer meeting tonight and maybe 20 people will show up. We, we, many of you, you hear one life, but it just, it's for someone else. It's not me. And I, I, don't, I don't want to bring in a guilt trip evangelism. I just want to illustrate the seriousness of what we're talking about. Notice the extremes exercised by the shepherd to find the lost. And then consider the great links he went to to find you. The psalmist asked, what is man that he is mindful of him? Who among us is so worthy that God should know or care about us? Yet he doesn't stand off at a distance, aloof and uncaring. He woos, he calls, he beckons, he seeks. The cosmos testify to his existence. His word and his son testify to his compassion. 
He is like a shepherd who after rounding up all but one sheep is not done with his work. And he doesn't seek us on the basis of what we might bring to the kingdom. What a preposterous notion. Jesus saying, look at that man. I can use him. He's got so many talents. He could set the world on fire. If he would only convert, I will pursue him for what he can do. Never. It is out of his mercy and kindness that God pursues us. And this compassionate shepherd won't rest when only one is missing. A similar scenario is in verse 8. What woman who has ten silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? This is also a person low on the social ladder, a woman. This is offensive to the Pharisees because every day they prayed, thanking God, among other things, that they were not a woman. Her crisis was worse than a shepherd's. A silver coin was worth a day's wages. Her whole life savings was ten days' wages. She lights a lamp, which means daylight is over, night is upon her. She is in a desperate search to find the coin. So she sweeps the house diligently and carefully until she finds it. This reinforces Jesus' first parable. Notice the intensity of the search. Verse 4, he goes after the lost one. Verse 8, she searches carefully. The search is the sole focus of the shepherd and the woman. They're distracted by nothing. The intensity of the search. Notice the persistency of it. Verse 4, he goes after it until he finds it. Verse 8, she, search, she searches carefully until she finds it. The search is not over until the lost is found. Now this has clear application to us. He came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. That means I need to go down the street to seek and save that which was lost. We have no power to save, but we do have the power to be faithful. We're responsible for faithfulness. The Holy Spirit is responsible for success. In the last eight days, I have invited one person to church and shared the gospel with the other, like pouring water on a flat rock. It's not a failure. The results are up to him. The alternative is to retreat into Phariseeism. As the world grows darker, the Pharisaical response is to close my door, curse the darkness, and condemn the lost. And this morning, if you say, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I just don't have no burden. I mean, I'm just not there. Then confess it and ask God to change you. Don't redirect responsibility to someone else. And, and, and let me caveat this. I know that there are problems that can so engulf our life that it causes us not only to forget about the loss, but almost everything else. I mean, we, we all run into problems that are so severe and deep that they take almost every waking moment. Remember that even in suffering, Jesus himself said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. If you are suffering, you will find that God will put you around other people with whom only you can connect based on the suffering that you're both enduring. Now this is what we call one life, and it is just like Jesus' life. Two types of sinners, one seeking Savior, and a time of great rejoicing. A shepherd finds the sheep. The reaction, verse 5. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders, and coming home, he calls his friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. Now, here would have been my reaction. You dumb sheep, where have you been? I have looked for you everywhere. Get up. Don't you ever do that again. Instead, he takes this sheep, which weighs maybe 70 pounds, and he puts it on his shoulders. Why? Because the sheep is worn and weary. He's lost. He's been wandering. And because the shepherd wants to bear the sheep's burden. So he keeps it on his shoulders, and he brings it all the way home. Does he view this as an annoyance? Look at verse 5. He joyfully puts it on his shoulders. In verse 6, he calls his friends and neighbors together, and he doesn't say, this pain in the neck, I finally found him. He says, rejoice with me. In verse 9, the woman finds the coin. She calls her friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. Verse 7 says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who do not need repentance. Look at that phrase, more joy in heaven. Think about this. There's already perfect joy in heaven. How can you have more joy? 
That's God's way of explaining to us that the redemption of a single soul brings utter joy to the God of the universe. And if God in heaven is happy, everybody else is happy, right? This tells us that God does not stand off at a distance. It tells us that deism, a theology that says God created the heavens and the earth and then walked away, is not true. But here's a question, and I know it's late. We had graduate recognition. We're just about done, so hang in there with me. How do we reconcile this with passages such as John chapter 6? In that passage, Jesus taught very difficult truths about following him. And the Bible says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. And Jesus didn't beg them back. He didn't soften or alter his message. He didn't pursue them. He just walked away. The Godhead will go to great lengths to seek you. Jesus created you. Jesus, or God created you. Jesus died for you. The Holy Spirit convicts you. Each person of the Godhead displaying his great love for you. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God and brings conviction to bear in your heart. You're aware of your sin. You know of his sacrifice. He invites you to be saved. You have a responsibility to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we reconcile this? The frequent warning of Scripture is harden not your heart. And continual hardening, resisting the Holy Spirit, heeding not His mercies, the conviction will dissipate. In John chapter 6, Jesus had been preaching and preaching and preaching. The people kept resisting. Jesus finally said, here it is, and He walked away. Now those stories are infuriating to the Pharisees. It has not yet occurred to them that there is no rejoicing in heaven when a scribe writes a law. It has not yet occurred to them that no one rejoices in heaven when a Pharisee washes his hands. Now what does this mean for us? Well, notice again verse 5. When the shepherd rejoices, what do his friends do? They rejoice. We are like our master when we seek that which is lost and rejoice when it is found. So let me just ask you a couple questions and then we'll be done. Do you rejoice over repenting sinners? Do you feel intense sorrow over other sinners' lostness? Or here's the key. Do you talk yourself into a modified universalism? Here's what I mean. We can, in theory, say that people with Christ are lost, but when it comes time and they've died... It's amazing how our theology becomes, well, everybody was saved. I mean, he was a good guy, and somewhere back there he spoke the name Jesus, and so we assume that he's going to be in heaven. That's a faulty assumption. We need to pray for people who aren't saved and to seek those who aren't saved. And for some of you, this is like climbing a huge mountain. How do you eat an elephant? one bite at a time. So if this is something that's tremendously challenging to you, just start with a name and begin to pray for them. And pray that God would put them in your path. And see what God might do. Now maybe today you're that lost sheep. You've never been saved and you know that the Holy Spirit is seeking you. First of all, I'd like you to talk to me or Ryan before you leave here. We'd love to talk to you about salvation right now. Another thing you can do is you can take that attendance slip and check on the box that you'd like to talk to someone about salvation and we'll be in touch. If you've never been baptized by immersion, check that box. We'll get in touch with you. We'd like to have a conversation about that. And if you've not explored membership, would you check that box as well? Thank you for your attentiveness. I'm going to ask a deacon to come and close us in prayer. We have a prayer meeting tonight at 530. There's no sermon tonight. It's just prayer. So we ask you to come for that. Is this... Can you, is this on, John? Or, Phil, is this on? It is. Okay, yes, it is. Mike Titterington is going to come. Thank you so much for being here. Again, if you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior, please talk to myself or Ryan or someone before you leave or check that box. God bless you. Nothing this Wednesday. We will see you tonight at 530 for a prayer meeting.